the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, lacrosse fans? You are watching the 100th episode of the Lax Factor Lacrosse Podcast. Big time for us. Uh, one of the things I planned to do was put this out live on YouTube, but knowing me, I work got in the way, family got in the way, and then it's just real hard. So I'm not big on pomp and circumstance anyway. I just want to talk about lacrosse. So I just decided, screw it, Thursday morning, we got a boatload of news. Let's do this. So 100th episode, thank you. Today, what we're going to talk about, PLL is coming back this summer. That's going to be big news here, and we're going to talk about that today. TD Erlen, he gets drafted and announces that he's returning to Yale in the same week. Jackson Morrill and Lucas Kotler, Yale's, uh, two, two Yale seniors, they decided they're going to play together, and they're going to head out west uh, to play at Denver. We're going to talk about that a little bit, and then we're going to talk a little bit about who would be the better attack, who's the best attack combo now, who's the best two-man attack combo now that uh, we're talking about Morrill going out to Denver. And then the question of the day, this was a hot topic in uh, one of the coaches' groups, was, is it important to players that coaches remain fit considering the coaches are going to be responsible for motivating the players to do the same? And this was a hot topic. A buttload of people got butt hurt in the forum. I actually heard lacrosse coaches use the term body shaming, which is ridiculous. If you are a lacrosse coach and the term body shaming is coming out of your mouth, we should probably revoke your man card. I'm not promoting picking on people, bullying people, or anything like that. But if you are a man talking about body shaming, man, I don't know about you anymore. And I do not feel the least bit bad about saying that. But anyway, let's get into this here now. Uh, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Just smash that like button and share this video with anybody that you can. Get the word out here. We're trying to keep this low key. We're trying not to have to change format. Uh, we don't have to stop cursing. I don't have to curse either. I'm trying to clean that up a little bit for the people who don't like that. But uh, there's a time and a place for everything. Uh, so moral of the story, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. You can do all that down here for the most part. And uh, we will get into this now. The biggest news here for lacrosse fans, for sports fans, period. The PLL is coming back. PLL announced the PLL Championship Series, a two-week quarantine and fanless tournament that will run from July 25th to August 9th. Rabel, because he's a boss, he doesn't just announce these things on social media anymore. He goes on today because that's how he rolls now, th now that he's a mogul, media mogul, business mogul, entrepreneur, quarantined and no fans they are going to lock these fools up throw away the key stick them on campus together wherever they decide to do this forever they're going to have a COVID-19 medical committee that will consist of multiple physicians including infectious disease experts players will constantly be evaluated locked down monitored make sure they're not screwing the pooch and putting everybody at risk the location is to be determined I've heard rumors that it would be an IMG academy which makes a ton of sense they have college slash pro-level facilities, uh, housing, cafeteria. They have everything you would need, and it's in Florida. But the reality here is they have lots of places that they could do this. Every college campus in the country is a potential landing spot for them now, not to mention a bunch of their players or college coaches uh, that have access to those facilities. So it'll be interesting to see where they play, but they're going to find someplace dope to play and, and hold up here. Week one starting on July 25th. And then the other genius thing about this is this is all going down, I believe, around the time that the Olympics were supposed to happen. No Olympics. Hey, we'll fill that void for America and for the rest of the world. I've seen people from Australia, the UK, all over the world saying, please tell me that we're going to be able to watch it here. Canada, you name it. So that was all good. Another thing to talk about here, I didn't put it in my notes, but it's worth talking about, is there is a travel ban right now between Canada and the U.S. I suspect they're going to have a way about around that to get their Canadian players to wherever they are playing. Um, so week one, 14, play, uh, 14 game group play. That is going to determine the seeding for the tournament. So they're going to play a boatload of games over that seven day period, probably two or three games a day, maybe three, four games a day. And then with breaks in between, we'll see how that goes. Week two, we'll see a single elimination tournament slash playoff, and that will span six games. And then we have the championship, or the champion of the tournament will be named the PLL champion for 2020. I think that's more than fair. All 20 games will be broadcast around or across NBC, NBC, uh, SN, NBC Sports Network, or NBC Sports Gold, and all will stream live on NBCSports.com and the NBC Sports app. 
Now, there's a ton of questions that are surrounding these, and uh, Dan Arte are. are I always, I always screw his name up. I always thought it was like Artesia is how I always pronounced it, but it's actually uh, uh, spelled Arestia or Aresta. So Dan, my man, he's one of the guys that I try to find all my breaking news from on Twitter. He says, and he has a bunch of questions that he's seen people pose and that he's posing. Uh, the U.S.-Canadian border was one of his questions, actually. So they're obviously going to get, a, get around that somehow. Um, and then he's talking about some players, coaches, officials have full-time jobs. How is the league going to handle that? I'm guessing... Guys that can't get around it aren't going to play, and the guys that can get around it are going to play. I believe that a lot of these employers, I mean, you just look at the number of college students who have had their future employers tell them, go back to school for a year, we'll wait for you, you can't pass that up. I presume a lot of these players are going to have employers that are the same. Uh, so they're going to figure it out. You know, People get two weeks off to go on vacation, they're going to get two weeks off to play their pro lacrosse tournament. This is a huge huge freaking deal not just to the lacrosse community because it is it's a huge deal to the lacrosse community but partly because it is a huge deal to the sports world right now because people do not have sports and if they pull this off and they're the first pro uh, sports franchise to really go out in the u.s and start playing people will tune in to watch they will gain a boatload uh you know, i think the technical term here is they will they will gain a shit ton of fans for sure so we will have lacrosse that is awesome we will have lacrosse, and it will be played over a period that the Olympics were supposed to be played, so that's going to be big. Brilliant strategy by Rabel and co., so hats off to them. It's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of days. I say it's going to be interesting a lot, I notice. i got to stop that. Uh, but we'll see how everything plays out over the next couple of weeks. But within, what, a month and a half, I think it is, out, we're going to have lacrosse again. So God bless the PLL. God bless America. And uh, we need ourselves some lacrosse badly because Korean baseball or whatever they were putting on, that just was not going to cut it with me at all. Not at all. Um, next up, more news here. We have TD Erlen is getting drafted by the MLL's long li uh, Okay, so one week we have TD Erlen. I don't know why I was reading that like an idiot. <laughs> I was zoning out totally. TD Erlen gets drafted by the MLL. And then within a couple of days announces he is returning to Yale. Long Island Lizards took him number one overall in the MLL draft, which I found odd because I feel like they're – why waste the number one pick on a guy you're not sure is ever going to end up playing on, playing for you? I'm, I'm surprised the MLL hasn't taken kind of a strategy. It's like, hey, we're going to dumb this down. We're going to have to slum it a little bit. We're not going to take the guys that normally we would take in the top ten because the chance they play for us instead of the PLL is slim to none. And I feel like it's kind of a wasted draft pick. So it'll be weird how that how that plays out because I don't see a world in which TD plays in the MLL. I see TD uh, playing in the PLL. I, I just it wouldn't make sense to me uh, for him to pick the MLL at this stage. But either way, he gets drafted and then he announces, "Hey, by the way, I'm coming back to Yale." Uh, it made sense to me because TD is a transfer. So how the Ivy League rule works, and I might get this a little bit wrong, but here's the general idea. If you go through your four years at an Ivy League institution, you play your lacrosse during that time. Lacrosse isn't what really matters. What matters is your time at school. So you're at school, you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you graduate. If you graduate from a Ivy League school, whereas like, let's say you graduate from Syracuse, you can stay around another year if you had to red shirt. Let's say you got injured your sophomore year, missed a season. Syracuse, you could play a super senior year uh, as a red shirt, you know, a, a senior red shirt. And you can go to school there for five years and play lacrosse there for four. You cannot do that in the Ivy. If you graduate, you are done. Rob Pinnell took advantage of a loophole many, many moons ago, famously while at Cornell, where he withdrew from school, I believe in the spring semester, didn't finish, skipped the fall, came back in the spring, got to play his final year. He was one of the few, if only, kind of super senior um, Ivy League athletes that I remember in lacrosse. Um, so TD's not doing that. TD, because he transferred, lost some credits, he needed either another two semesters or one semester to finish his degree, and he has a year of eligibility because of the NCAA. So it was not a red shirt granted by Yale. He was still nor just at school like normal through 2021 uh, in Yale. So therefore, he gets to play lacrosse because he has a year of eligibility. That's what I believe is going down. Uh, I'm not sure if maybe this is to force some kind of decision, but uh, by the sounds of it, it looks like he's probably going to be able to play there, but we'll find out in the coming days. Uh, but then what surprised me even like more than that was people – people's naivety around how the draft in the MLL works and all that crap. People were like, wait a minute, TD got drafted by the Long Island Lizards. Now he has to play in the MLL. Why did he do that? No, people. 
the PLL and the MLL can just draft people all willy-nilly, and then the players get to pick where they go. Now, let's say he got drafted in both leagues and decided to play in the PLL for a year, let's say. Uh, the MLL team that drafted him would retain his rights for X amount of time. So if he decided to jump ship from the MLL or PLL and go to the MLL, I think the Lizards would still get him. So I think that's their idea, staking claim to that player just in case he decides to come to us, even if he goes elsewhere first. They end up having like protected um, designations and things like that that surround it. So I always I thought it was weird that people just assumed he got drafted, he was going to play there, he wasn't coming back to college. My whole thinking all along was he's going back to college probably. And then my thinking beyond that was, even if he got drafted by the Lizards, he's not playing there. He's going to play in the PLL. TD Erlin, mark my words, is a PLL guy. I don't know this. I have no insight. I just feel it in my bones. And uh, so, but then he goes around and surprises everybody afterwards and says, nope, I'm coming back to play Lax. And apparently he's going to get to do that. That's a huge pickup for Yale, though. Yale is going to lose a bunch of seniors, as are all of the Ivy League schools. So Yale loses Morrill and Kotler, but they're going to at least be able to hold on to TD. They've got Brandau still. They've got a, they've got a lot of uh, a talent on that team, but they are not going to be the contender next year that they were this year. I had been after they won the national championship in 2019. Was it 2019? 2018. I had been telling everybody, listen, they are going to be a legitimate contender in 2019 as well. They're going to be a legitimate contender in 2020. I'm not going to be saying that about Yale next year. Yale, I do not believe, is going to be one of even the top five or ten teams uh, ready to contend. I could be wrong. You know, They're going to reload, but I think the Ivy League as a whole is going to take a step back because they're losing – all of their seniors and those senior, a lot of those seniors aren't just leaving the landscape, not playing anymore. They're going to other teams and some of these other teams are freaking stacked. So that is going to lead me into my next point. The rich are getting richer and we are seeing it now with Jackson Morrill and Lucas Kotler, both Yale seniors, both really good players. Morrill, one of the top five attackmen in the country, hands down. Kotler, one of the best top, I'd say one of the top 20 mids. I mean, you put him on other rosters where he can shine a little bit more, and I think he'd tear it up. He went uh, 16 and 10, I think, um, in 2019, and he was on pace to have a really good 2020 season as well. A really, really good all-around solid midfielder would be on the first line almost everywhere that he plays. Morrill will start on attack anywhere he goes. Almost anywhere Morrill goes that doesn't have a Mike Sowers on the roster, Morrill will be the best player, if not one of the best two players uh, there. So, Right off the bat, Denver already had a loaded team. They've already got Jungle Jack, Hannah. They've already got uh, Sil Strop, the freshman who looked good. But more importantly, Ethan freaking Walker. If Ethan Walker comes back as well, which I don't see why he wouldn't, I believe that you will probably see Ethan Walker return. Denver is now a serious contender. You have Jackson Morrill, who is a great quarterback type 50-50 attackman, a guy who can carry the ball, who given the right, and, and he fits perfectly in that Denver system where it's conservative, but we will still give you your touches. We'll still let you be aggressive. We're still going to let you score goals, but we're going to do it in a structured manager at man, manner. I think Morrill is perfect for that offense, and I think that you put you put um, Ethan Walker uh, on the opposite side of the field as him, especially Walker, a lefty finisher, one of the best lefty finishers in the country, top five lefty finishers, top five finishing attackmen in the country, mixed with one of the just top five all-around attackmen, period, in the country. That is a very, very formidable attack duo. Throw Silstrop or whoever else ends up stealing that third spot into that mix, and you have one of the best attack groups in the country right there in Denver. You did not have that until you added Morrill, though. Morrill is a huge get for them. And then you add Kotler. Imagine a midfield line with two big boys on it, like Kotler and Jungle Jack Hanna. That is going to, Hanna had kind of emerged at the beginning here of 2020 as one of the best midfielders in the country. I had him in my top 10 as just, you know, he was a great midfielder as a sophomore. As a junior, he was dominating uh, his opponent. So that's huge from a mid midfield perspective for, for Denver also. So Denver just got really good. And just to give you an idea, Morrill, like for people who aren't familiar with Morrill and don't realize how good he is, second all-time leading scorer at Yale, and he ha didn't even have his full senior year to play yet. Uh, 220 career points, fifth all-time in goals. I mean, he's he's going up against, you know, Yale has a very good and very storied quality lacrosse program. Morrill is one of the best to do it there ever. That means Morrill is one of the best attackmen to play the game right now. So you throw Walker in there. 
one of the best one-two attack tandems in the country. And then what I wanted to talk about was who would make a better two-attack combo. You know, we, we already know the the groups that are the best attack groups overall simply because they have the big names mixed with, with really good role players. So as we're looking at attacks, we're going to talk about the Dukes, the Virginias, you know, and the, 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 the North Carolinas now even. But compare – let's compare that moral Ethan Walker – um, attack combo attack unit to Sowers and a Williams. So let's let's take Duke. Is it Sowers Williams that you would compare him to? Dyson Williams. Is it Sowers or Robertson or Sowers or Manown? You know, one thing's for sure. I think if you look at the Duke attack and compare that now to the Denver attack, I think Duke may have a little bit more depth just because Sowers is the best attack but in the country. And then guys, I don't think they have an Ethan Walker caliber talent there. I think Walker ends up getting the nod over the two guy at Duke, but that three guy at Duke is you know is probably better than Silstrap. You got uh, Robertson and Manown, who if they both come back are both uh, seasoned veterans. And then you have guys like um, Williams, who was looking really good, and and the void beyond there can just keep getting filled. But if you had to pick between okay, hey, I'm going to take these top two guys, or I'm going to take these top two guys. Who do you take? Do you take Moral or Walker over Sowers and whoever you could put up there at Duke, or do you take uh, uh, Sowers? And I'd say I'd probably go with any any group that has Sowers. In this case, if Mike Sowers' name is in the mix, I take that group because I think Mike Sowers is so good. Whoever your second attackman is, he's going to elevate that person to be as good of a finisher as anybody, assuming that player gels in that way. And, and Duke is going to have a guy who is going to gel opposite of Sowers and put up a buttload of goals, maybe a couple of them. So in that case, I take the Duke attack. I take the top two Duke attackmen over the Denver attack. Now, here's where we start to get hairy. Let's compare him to Kraus and more. Now, I think UVA overall, probably the best three attackmen all in to, that play together because Kraus, Moore, and Laviano play really well together, but they're also perfect complements. Kraus is that 50 50 guy that can dodge and feed and quarterback and oh, Moore is a filthy dodger. He can do it all, but he's really that guy. You need a goal, you give the ball to Moore. And then Laviano is the perfect complement to those two as an off ball attackman and as a guy who just wants to play off ball, back, uh, back cut. Uh, jump on people and do spins when people score goals. I love Laviano's energy, but we're only talking here about Kraus and Moore. Kraus Moore compared to Morrill and Walker. I'm starting to get confused with them here. And in this case here, I'd say it's a wash. You know, you, the I would almost say Kraus Moore are probably a little bit more quality together overall than Morrill Walker. I think that Morrill's probably the best attackman out of all of them, but I think that Walker's probably the fourth guy in, in that list. But the way that Morrill and Walker gel together with a quarterback and then an off-ball guy, especially considering this off-ball guy is a lefty sniper uh, who can two-dodge well and all that, two-step dodge. I had him in the two-step dodge video. I actually showed you one of his goals. You can look at that. That's on our channel. Watch our our, uh, our film review type videos that we do. But uh, I would say that I the fact that Morrill and Walker match up so well together opposite of each other, I'd say that makes that a wash. That battle's a wash because I think that you know, you'd know you take either of them and you'd be like, hey, I'm not going to be mad if I get either of these groups here. Uh, whereas I take Sowers over anybody, that one, UVA top two versus the Denver top two, I take the neither. I'd just flip a coin. I would take either of them and I'd be happy. And then we'll do with another hot one because it's uh, Gray, Chris Gray at North Carolina. So Gray and Solomon were proving to be a ridiculously solid, I say ridiculously a lot too, a really, really solid attack duo. Gray putting up a boatload of points. Solomon also, and both of them were close to 50-50. Gray was above it. He was like at a 30-20 threshold, and but Solomon was pretty close to 50-50. I think that when you get to those two and you compare them, I think Moral is as good as Gray, if not better. And then I think that Walker is better than Solomon overall, at least a little bit more seasoned. So I think at that level, I would take Moral and uh, Walker over Solomon and Gray. So just a little thought experiment I figured we'd do as we're sitting here rambling on on this 100th episode. We are kind of in the middle here now. We may be a little bit over, over half. I can't remember. But either way, uh, at our middle point, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And I didn't say it before. You can go to laxfactor.com and get yourself some swag. We have hats. We have T-shirts. I got these dope shirts from Tamil Lacrosse, Mike Shantz. 
Uh, not a paid promotion. I bought these, but they did a great job getting me some Lax Factor Under Armour gear. I needed that badly. But you can go to laxfactor.com. We have all sorts of lacrosse t-shirts and all sorts of other swag that you can get. Some of it podcast related. Some of it just normal lacrosse stuff. So be sure to go there as well. You can watch all these videos here as well. So do that as well. All right. Now we get to uh, what I think is going to be the final segment is the question of the day. Is it important to players that coaches remain fit considering the coaches are going to be responsible for motivating the players to do the same? So really, this is a question that you'd want to ask the players. I'm biased because I'm a former coach and I'm also not in great shape, nor was I in great shape when I played. I think I was surprised at the number of people in the lacrosse group that this question was posted that got butt hurt by it. If you are a lacrosse coach and a man, and this is going to get me in trouble, I'm going to say it anyway because I don't care, and I can say it because you can't do anything to me. Um, if you are a man and you are talking about fat shaming or body shaming in a public group, maybe we should take your man card away because, listen, men – are going to, I don't want to say the men are going to be men because then all you hippie weirdos are going to jump all over me for that too, but it's the truth. Listen, fat shaming. Uh, it's not fat shaming to ask a question in a public group should coaches try to remain fit to be good examples for their players. If you are saying that's body shaming or fat shaming, you are a moron. You are a moron. That I thought it was a pretty reasonable question. Now, I think some of the people were upset at the way it was framed because the guy kind of asked the question and then he kind of said, but I stay in good shape. So it was like, yeah, okay, that was a little bit of a douchey way to go about asking it. But asking the question in general and the conversation around, is it better for coaches to be in good shape? Is it going to help them? I mean, that's a completely legitimate question. And I am going to answer it for you now. And I'm going to do it by levels because I think that's important. Uh, and no, this is not body shaming fat people. I myself am a fat person. I am considered obese. I'm rock. I, I gained 10 pounds since the COVID thing started. So I'm tipping the scales at about 240 right now. Technically, I've gained like 14, 15 pounds since the COVID thing started. So I am not a skinny man. So I can say this just like a, a black guy can say the N word. And uh, that's the only example I have right here. Our gay guys can say all sorts of cool gay slang that other people can't say. I am fat guy. So I'm going to be able to say all this crap and no one can complain about it. So shut up. But here we go. Youth. Does it matter if your youth coach is a fat guy or a guy who's not in shape? No, it doesn't matter. Does it even matter if your youth coach played lacrosse or not? No, as long as he tries hard, as long as he's teaching the right things to the kids and, you know, listening to the other people who may know a little bit more, doing some research, youth in shape, out of shape. We can't, beggars can't be choosers. We need youth coaches. So I posit it does not matter at that level, how great a shape. And now, I mean, if you're some big, fat, enormous dude, that's going to present all sorts of other challenges. And yes, it's going to play. And for anybody who says, well, that's fat shaming. Big, fat guys should be able to coach across too. Sure. I don't care personally, but let's not pretend like being big and fat is awesome. You know, biologically, if you are big and fat, the chances that you pair bond with the opposite sex is going to be more difficult to make it go down. I mean, everything about biology would indicate that humans, that being fat or not matters to humans at the biological evolutionary level. Being fat automatically sends a signal to a woman's brain. If you're a guy, if you're a big fat dude, it'll send a signal to the woman's brain that, okay, that person's not as healthy. Automatically, she is less likely to consider you as a mate. It's just the way it works. I'm not trying to be mean. If I, I pair bonded when I was a younger man and when I was thin, I would have a much harder time pair bonding right now at my current weight. That's just a fact. Let's not get butt hurt by this. Um, mod I, I rambled a little bit. Modified JV official club, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter as much. It depends on the level, I think. And what I'm saying here is it doesn't matter at all. I don't think it matters. Like, you know, look at Desco, look at Petro. Those guys weren't in the best shape. They haven't been in good shape in a long time. They won national championships when they were in bad shape. It doesn't matter. What matters is your coach's background in lacrosse the type of person that they are, the type of coaching skill they're bringing to the table there, you know, all of that matters in the end. It doesn't matter if you're in shape. What I want to touch on is the fact that does it help? If you compare, if you put Petro and you put Tillman in the same room with a player in his family, does the fact that Tillman is in better shape than Petro play? And I think the answer has to be, if you're being totally honest, a little, a little, if maybe it doesn't even play uh, consciously in those people's decisions, but does it play subconsciously? Absolutely. Every single human being that looks at another human being 
there is a quick little biological mechanism, you know, electronic impulse that goes through your head that automatically notices the weight and the overall health of a person. So if I'm a parent and a player and I'm sitting here talking to two different coaches, does the fact that Petro's out of shape, Tillman's in great shape, or Desco's out of shape, and and um, name any other co young coach who's in killer shape that looks like they could step on a field right now, does that play into the player's decision, into the parent's decision, into how they feel about that person? The answer, unequivocally, 100%, yes. It plays. I do not know how much it plays. You'd need to talk to a psychologist or someone a lot smarter than me. So it's, it's way above my pay grade to decide how much that plays into it. But to pretend that there's absolutely nothing that plays into it is stupid. If you're a coach and you're sitting here thinking, all right, I got a checklist of things that I can do to improve my chances of you know, being a better coach, being a better motivator, and being a better recruiter, if staying in shape and being a good example. And I guess you could even just say being a good example trumps everything else. And, you know, for Petro, being a good example meant he was a good man. He was an honorable man. He was a the best lacrosse player as a defender to ever play the game. I mean, his his resume and his coaching prowess is not cannot be questioned in any manner. Maybe you could talk about the time. Maybe it's just past time at Hopkins for him. I don't think that it necessarily was. Um, but you could, you could say that all those things make up for that one thing, but to pretend that if he didn't add that one other thing to his resume, if he was somehow was able over the last 10 years to fix his back problem and the health problem and get himself in better shape, would that have helped him recruiting? Could he have gained a player here and there simply because of that fact? Maybe, you know, to say no is stupid, you know, because you don't know. And there's some things that you can say, ah, that wouldn't matter in this scenario, at least in terms of you wouldn't lose a player in the recruiting process because of it, but to pretend that you might not gain one, certainly you can't say that. I mean, a player is looking at a coach and the, the man who's about to lead him into the battlefields and is going to expect a lot out of that player over the, the rest of that player's life, it's not too much to ask for that guy to also embody the very things that you're going to ask that player to do. In Petro's case and Desco's case, their body of work is is all they need. They do not need to be in stellar shape to be incredible coaches, good recruiters, and to run a successful program. But for all those people who try to pretend like it doesn't play at all and it shouldn't and it's body shaming to even discuss it, get bent, man. It it does play 100% a little bit at least. There it does it, it is going to factor into it. So, you know, what do you think on that topic? Uh, as a player, especially, the, the players that are listening are the ones that I'm the most curious about. As a player, what do you think uh, about your player's health and their, their fitness? Does it play, if you got a coach like me who's just standing there making you run sweet 16s over and over and over again, and you know that I couldn't run eight of them without, you know, having a heart attack, does that play into your willingness to run those sweet 16s for me? Because I will tell you, as a coach, and I was not this incredible monster coach, I coached freaking high school in Juco ball, you know, I mean, I, I coached, but I didn't coach at ridiculously high levels. It didn't ever seem to play. Uh, with me also, though, and it kind of ties into it. I wasn't really terribly out of shape, but I was e easily as out of shape at my age that I was when I was coaching as Petro was at his. He was probably in far better shape than me at that time. Uh, the, and the kicker with me was similarly what, to what I said um, about the background. I mean, my lacrosse background was good enough that despite my the fact I couldn't hop on the field and run those 16s with him, I had – I don't want to call it clout. It's a, the wrong word for it. I had a – I had – the proper credentials, let's say. I played at the college that I was coaching at. I, at the time, I believe if I wasn't, I wasn't the all-time leading scorer at the school, but I had the all-time single season points record at the school that I was coaching at, as well as the uh, single game points record and single game goals record, uh, 10 goals. I had a game where I went 10 and two. Um, so it's like, you know, I was a good player. I wasn't a great player, but I was a good player. And I was, if you were to compare me in my playing days to my average player, I was as good, maybe even a little better than the average player, uh, definitely better than the average player I coached. Because when I played at Broome, I was the you know leading scorer on my team. So in that light, I was better than most of the players I coached. Uh, uh, but even the best players that we had, I was in line with them until my the year I was an assistant. And then that year we had a boatload of guys that I was not as good at. All three of our starting attackmen uh, the one year were probably better than I was when I was a player when I was an assistant after I was the head coach for six years. So the answer is no. 
A coach does not need to be in stellar shape to be able to be a great motivator, a great coach, a great leader of men. But to pretend that if you added that on top of everything else that it wouldn't help a little bit is being naive or just intellectually dishonest. Absolutely. If you if there's 10 things that make a great coach and one of those 10 things is to be physically fit because you're going to have to ask people to do things that you should be able to do, or at least that will help as a motivating factor, if that's the 10th thing, um, then it's going to help if you are that thing. Uh, to pretend otherwise is just, you know, fallen victim to the snowflake generation. And uh, truthfully, if you're a guy saying, oh, that's body shaming, you know, you are a pansy. Uh, maybe you're a pansy that could beat me up, but it doesn't mean that you're not an emotional pansy. Uh, and I do stand by that. So that's this episode, 100th episode. Kind of doesn't seem like it was as big of a deal as it should have been, but that's just kind of how I roll anyway. I'm just happy to get to 100 episodes and to get this one under my belt and to get it out. And moving forward again, I keep talking about this, what we're going to do. We're going to keep doing those instructional videos. People, they don't play as well. They don't get as many views, but the interaction and the discussions that they start in some of the groups does well. So I typically don't want to put a video out unless it's going to do a thousand plus views on YouTube. And then however other many views it does on all the other platforms between podcast, audio only, and Instagram and Facebook when we put them up there. But the... Uh, instructional videos and those kinds of things. We're going to keep putting those out. And even those those don't always do over a thousand views, they will get to live for the long haul. So they'll slowly but surely get up there. So we're going to keep doing that. And I think the main thing we're going to do with this show, we're going to turn this into talk radio, folks. I think that we're going to start doing longer shows closer to the 30 minute mark of rambling with these. Maybe we'll even get a bit, little bit above and beyond that. I'm going to try to focus in the, the immediate future of getting to the point where we're doing one 30 minute show per week with a bunch of instructional kind of side videos that go with that. So that may mean five, 10 minute videos pop up that are newsworthy in the middle of the week, but I'm going to try to either on Wednesday or Thursday, keep putting this out now. And now that we're getting back out of the COVID, we're going to try to start following a schedule. When the season's up, we follow a schedule. When there is no season and there is no news, it's harder to follow a schedule because maybe Wednesday hits and there's no great news. That's what happened yesterday. I thought about putting this out yesterday. Wednesday morning, there wasn't a whole ton of news. And by the end of the day yesterday, there was a boatload of news that we could talk about. So the goal here, put up one 30-minute full talk show every week, put up a bunch of the instructional kind of film review videos, training videos, uh, put up a couple of those every week, and then just see what we do. And then once the PLL starts, that two-week period, we're going to cover that like savages. So that is the plan here, and then we'll see what happens coming into the fall of next season. And we'll we're, obviously, we're going to have to cover more pro uh, because we're not going to have college across again in, until at least next spring. I don't think we're going to have a fall season. So that's the plan. I appreciate you all kind of just fl flubbing through it with me, watching as we put as I put videos up and things of that sort. And uh, I will be back next week for another long 30-minute show. Uh, same day, we're going to do it again on Thursday for that show as well. And I may shift it to Wednesday. I'll play around with it, but I'll always let you know the week before if I'm going to do the next one on Wednesday or Thursday, simply because I want to see what gets more views. If I put the show out on Wednesday, then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's kind of a good hot view period. Just trying to give you a little bit, a little bit of insight into my noggin here and what's going on in this head of mine. So as always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Thank you for watching the 100th episode, and uh, Hoost is out. Mm -hmm.